every railway engineer in the 1800s insisted no train could ever scale a mountain. Wheel friction would fail, and gears under such force were a disaster waiting to happen. Yet one inventor's impossible rack and pinion design not only defied this consensus, it shattered the limits of railway technology and redrew the economic map for entire regions. If the world's most respected experts were so sure, what did they miss? And why were critics left ridiculing a breakthrough that would transform the future of locomotives forever? The answer begins where the laws of physics met human doubt. Steel wheels on steel rails, the foundation of every railway, depend entirely on friction. That friction, measured as the coefficient of adhesion, is surprisingly limited. For a locomotive, the practical ceiling is a gradient of about 4 to 6%. Beyond that, the smooth iron tires simply cannot grip the smooth rail tightly enough. When a train tries to climb a steeper slope, the driving wheels begin to spin uselessly, no matter how much weight or power is applied. Add more weight and the fragile rails of the era would bend, crack, or shatter. Engineers in the 19th century could calculate these limits with stark clarity. The coefficient of friction between steel wheel and rail hovers around 0.2 under ideal, dry conditions. On a 4% grade, a locomotive's entire weight is just enough to keep the wheels biting into the rail. Push that grade to 6% and even a perfectly balanced train risks slipping backward with every revolution. Any trace of rain, oil, or ice on the rail drops the available friction even further. Even the boldest railway builders knew the numbers. Mainline routes in the United States and Europe rarely exceeded 2% for long distances. The most daring mountain lines like the Baltimore and Ohio Kingwood Tunnel or the Semmering Pass in Austria crept up to 4 or 5 percent, but only for short stretches and only with special engines. For any grade above that, the math was unforgiving. Trains would stall, wheels would spin, and the whole idea of conquering a mountain with rails seemed to collapse under its own physics. This was not just an engineering headache, it was a hard physical barrier. Entire regions sat isolated behind slopes steeper than a gentle hill, their economies stunted by the impossibility of rail access. For the engineers of the day, the numbers on the page were not just theory, they were an ironclad verdict against any attempt to climb real mountains by rail. Anyone proposing to go steeper was inviting ridicule, or worse, disaster. Sylvester Marsh's proposal landed in the New Hampshire State House like a bad joke. Lawmakers and local dignitaries greeted his mountain railway scheme with open laughter, not debate. The official journals from 1858 record his petition for a charter, but the mood in the chamber survives mostly in legend. One legislator suggested amending the bill to grant Marsh a charter to build a railroad to the moon. Whether those words were ever spoken on the record, the sentiment was unmistakable. Marsh's idea was treated as so far-fetched, so outside the bounds of reason, that the only fitting comparison was lunar travel. In committee rooms and taverns, the ridicule grew sharper. Seasoned engineers and politicians alike dismissed the plan as the fantasy of a Chicago meatpacker with more money than sense. One local account from the period described the project as Marsh's folly, a phrase that stuck to him for years. The technical men, the ones who built and ran the region's railroads, scoffed at the idea that gears and cogs could haul a train up the side of Mount Washington. They warned of shattered teeth, runaway cars, and certain disasters. One observer quipped that if Marsh wanted to throw his fortune into the abyss, let him have his fun, so long as the rest of us were not asked to follow. The mockery was not just technical, it was cultural. The White Mountains had become a symbol of New England pride, and the suggestion that a steam-powered contraption might climb their slopes struck many as an affront to nature and to common sense. Marsh was lampooned in local papers, 
and his name became shorthand for impossible schemes. The legislature granted the charter, but only because a later chronicler wrote that they never believed he would actually try. Yet for Marsh, every jeer and joke was fuel. The more they doubted him, the more determined he became to prove them wrong. The chorus of skepticism from Concord's State House would echo in his ears as he set out to build not just a railway, but a rebuttal to every voice that had called him mad. Sylvester Marsh's path to invention began far from the world of railroads. Raised in Campton, New Hampshire, Marsh built his fortune in the Chicago meatpacking industry, earning a reputation for tenacity and risk-taking. By the time he returned to New Hampshire in his 50s, Marsh was known for his stubborn resolve, qualities that would soon be tested by a mountain few dared to challenge. The idea for the Mount Washington Railway took root after Marsh's own punishing climb to the summit. Caught in the mountain's notorious weather, he emerged half-frozen and determined to spare others the ordeal. What started as a personal promise quickly became an obsession. Marsh immersed himself in technical sketches, reached out to machinists, and began to imagine a railway that could conquer slopes no train had ever climbed. He moved from vision to action. In September 1861, Marsh filed his first United States patent for a rack railway. The design called for a cog-driven locomotive engaging a fixed rack between the rails, allowing trains to scale grades far steeper than traditional railways. Marsh's patent did not just outline a concept. It addressed the brutal conditions of Mount Washington, anticipating the ice, wind, and relentless strain his invention would face. By January 1867, Marsh advanced his design with a second patent. This time he introduced the ladder rack, two iron bars, with rollers forming a continuous ladder for the locomotive's central cogwheel. The system ensured at least two teeth of the pinion always gripped the rack, minimizing derailment and providing the traction needed to fight gravity and the mountain's elements. Marsh's letters from these years, preserved in patent archives, reveal a man beset by doubt but never defeated. He wrote of technical setbacks, skeptical engineers, and the financial risks of pursuing what many dismissed as Marsh's folly. Still, he pressed on, investing his own money and reputation. He believed that a working stretch of track would silence critics and prove his rack and pinion system was more than a wild gamble. With patents secured and a charter in hand, Marsh turned from paper to iron, determined to build the prototype that would test both his invention and his resolve. At the heart of Marsh's design sits the ladder rack, two sturdy iron bars running between the rails, joined by regularly spaced rollers that form a continuous line of rungs. The locomotive's pinion, a deep-toothed gear mounted under the frame, drops between these rollers, so at least two teeth are always locked in place. This is not just about moving uphill, it is about controlling force. The rack and pinion system transforms the engine's power through heavy reduction gearing. Roughly 10 turns of the engine for every one turn of the pinion. That massive ratio trades speed for torque, giving the train the muscle to climb grades up to 37%, where ordinary wheels would just spin. The physical connection between pinion and rack means the locomotive cannot slip, but it also cannot coast. Every bit of movement, up or down, is governed by the teeth. Marsh's patent drawings show how the design spreads force across multiple points of contact, reducing the chance of a single tooth failing under strain. If a tooth or roller breaks, the others still hold, preventing the catastrophic disengagement that critics warned about. This multi-point contact is what makes the system reliable. Safety was never left to chance. Each locomotive carried two independent braking systems. The main brake, controlled by a centrifugal governor, acts directly on the drivetrain. As the train descends, if speed creeps above safe limits, 
the governor automatically tightens the brake, holding speed steady without human input. This automatic control was essential, was essential on slopes where gravity could quickly outrun a brakeman's reflexes. Automatic intervention saved lives. Backing up the governor brake, a separate hand-operated friction brake acts on the wheels or a dedicated drum. If the engine or pinion fails, the crew still has a direct mechanical way to stop the train. Both systems were designed to default to safe. If a part fails or pressure drops, the brakes engage rather than release. Marsh's ladder rack, deep toothed pinion, and layered brakes answered every technical objection with hard engineering. The system did not just move trains uphill, it kept them under control in both directions. With built-in redundancy that made runaway disasters far less likely than skeptics feared, the result was a railway that could climb where none had gone before, without gambling safety on a single piece of iron. Laying rack railway track on a mountainside was never just a matter of engineering. It was an economic gamble from the start. The central rack, with its heavy iron bars and precision machined rollers, cost several times more per mile than plain rail. Each three meter rack segment had to be custom fitted, shipped up rough mountain roads, and bolted down with exacting care. For every mile of track, the company ledger shows a premium not just in material, but in labor. Skilled machinists and blacksmiths handled the installation. Trestles and bridges built to support both the weight and the unique stresses of rack operation soaked up capital at a rate that startled even seasoned railroad men. Once the line opened, the financial burden did not ease. The rack and pinion system demanded constant vigilance. Every tooth in the rack, every roller, every bolt had to be inspected after each run. Maintenance logs from the 1870s list daily rounds for crews checking for cracked teeth, loose fastenings, and the telltale signs of metal fatigue that could spell disaster on a 37% grade. In winter, snow and ice worked their way into every joint, forcing expensive shutdowns and repairs. The annual budget for spare parts and labor often rivaled the original construction outlay. Operating the locomotives brought its own costs. The unique gear trains and braking systems wore out faster than on flatland engines, and every breakdown required parts that could not be bought off the shelf. Training a crew for rack railway service took weeks, not days, and the company paid a premium wage for men who could handle the mountain's demands. The result was a railway that worked where nothing else could, but only at a price. For every ticket sold to a summit-bound tourist, a significant share went straight back into the relentless cycle of inspection, repair, and replacement. These hard numbers shaped the future of rack railways. They thrived only where the terrain left no other choice and where the traffic could justify the ongoing expense. Niklaus Riggenbach entered the rack railway scene in Switzerland just after Marsh's ladder system made its mark on Mount Washington. In 1863, Riggenbach patented his own ladder rack. Two steel bars joined by cross pieces forming a rigid frame between the rails. Unlike Marsh's rollers, Riggenbach's design used fixed transverse teeth, each one shaped in space to spread the locomotive's force evenly. When the Witznau Riggibahn opened in 1871, it brought the it brought this new rack system to the Alps, handling grades up to 25% and drawing crowds eager to climb above Lake Lucerne. The search for better solutions continued. Roman ABT working in Switzerland in the early 1880s, saw that the ladder rack's complexity made switches and crossings difficult and costly. Abt's answer was simple and clever. He replaced the ladder with two or three solid steel bars, each with vertical teeth mounted in parallel but offset. This way, as the locomotive's pinion turned, at, le at least one tooth was always fully engaged. The result was smoother running less shock, and a rack that was easier and cheaper to build and maintain. Abt patented his system in 1882, refining it in 1885. Railways in Switzerland, Austria, Germany's Hardsbahn, and Colorado's Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway 
soon adopted Abt's design for their steepest climbs. By the 1890s, Emil Strube introduced another approach. His 1896 patent featured a single flat steel bar with vertical teeth cut into its upper surface. Strub's rack was easier to install and maintain, especially in harsh alpine weather where ladder racks could clog with snow or ice. Its simple geometry allowed for easy transitions between rack and regular rails, making it ideal for lines like the Jungfrau Railway, which still uses Strub's system today. Riggenbach's ladder, Abt's offset bars, and Strub's single tooth rail each solved the same challenge in their own way, reflecting the ongoing push for reliability and practicality in mountain railroading. At the very edge of what steel wheels and gears can achieve, the Pilatus Railway in Switzerland stands as a living testament to how far rack and pinion ingenuity can go. Opened in 1889, the Pilatus Bond climbs slopes that would have been dismissed as fantasy by even the boldest early railway engineers. The line tackles an unbroken 48% gradient, the steepest ever attempted on a public railway. This was possible only because of Edward Locker's radical horizontal tooth rack system, a design that locked trains to the track both vertically and laterally, making derailment from upward or sideways forces physically impossible. Where other systems risked the pinion climbing out of the rack on extreme grades, Locker's design gripped the rack from both sides, holding fast even, even on a slope that feels more like a wall than a hill. Locomotives and cars on Pilatus are built with this unique geometry in mind. The rack sits in the center, its teeth cut horizontally, and the pinion wheels mesh from either side. No other rack railway in the world operates on such a steep, sustained incline. Even today, more than a century after Locker's first train climbed toward the clouds above Lake Lucerne, the Pilatus Bahn runs daily, carrying thousands of passengers each year to the summit. The line has seen new rolling stock, modern electric motors, and computer-aided controls, but the heart of the system, the locker rack, remains unchanged. Switzerland has become the global capital of rack railways, with around 40 lines in operation, most of them climbing grades that would be impossible for any conventional train. These lines, scattered across the Alps, form a network that brings tourists, workers, and supplies to places that once seemed unreachable. The Pilatus Bond's daring climb is not an outlier, but the pinnacle of a national tradition. In the mountains of Switzerland, rack and pinion is not a curiosity. It is the standard solution for the most demanding terrain on earth. Each successful climb up Pilatus is a quiet rebuke to the skeptics who once insisted that such slopes were beyond the reach of steel and steam. Today, rack railways still conquer grades that defy conventional trains, a direct legacy of problem solving over perfection. As climate change and resource demands push infrastructure into harsher terrain, the world faces new impossible challenges. The rack and pinions lesson is clear. Sometimes the only real breakthrough is the one experts refuse to consider. What boundaries will we question next? Share your thoughts below.